Cool. So what we have today is a live panel discussion um, with, you know, as we work through technology. It is impressive that we have uh, participating on this call uh, folks from uh, from the UK to Helsinki to LA, Buffalo, New York. And then are you in New York, New York, Christoph? I'm, I'm here in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, and uh, I am in Old Orchard Beach, Maine. Uh, so to get us started, our, our participants, uh, well, I'll look at them from left to right. We do have uh, Christoph, creator from Leviathan Chronicles, uh, all, all audio drama podcast, Leviathan Chronicles, uh, sci-fi about immortals. Uh, Christoph, welcome. Thanks very much for having us. We have Claire Eden, uh, one Hello. of the creators of really one of the know. creators of Minister of Chance. Uh, uh, in the same universe is, is Doctor Who, one of the characters, uh, one of, another story of another Time Lord. Um, fantastic science fiction. All right, we got Casey Whalen joining us from L.A., creator of We're Alive. Hey, Casey. Hi, Fred. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, the We're Alive, of course, the a huge zombie apocalypse podcast. Uh, very close to your fourth season. You're now in the midst of recording it now, Casey. Is that true? Uh, we premiered live uh, last Monday, actually. Awesome. And Joel is back on. Joel Metzger, uh, creator of Hot House Bruiser. Joel kind of helped, was the ringleader, pull us all together. Uh, Joel is the creator of uh, Hot House Bruiser, a uh, noir futuristic drama set in a, an apocalyptic Los Angeles where uh, you know things are not as they seem and people have been quarantined and you know strange things are happening there. Um, but you're joining us from Helsinki, Finland, Joel. Is that true? Yes, I'm in Helsinki, Finland, of all places. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 brings you there? I'm shooting a documentary. We were just in London and then we came here. We'll be here for a couple of days and then back to London and back to LA. Excellent. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, it's about it's 10:21 p.m. here right now. Um, Last but not least, Oral Stage Studios, you guys back? Yeah, we're back. We're back. Okay, Monique and Matthew Boudreau from Buffalo, New York. Um, uh, fantastic uh, writers and uh, producers and audio sound design and uh, many other talents. Uh, they're of, you guys are also working on a new production right now. Um, and in, in, in a departure, you're now doing it on your home turf and not in New York or not in Maine and not in, uh, or connected across the world like, as you've done. Yeah, we, we kind of did things backwards, and we started, we started uh, in, in New York City, and we started working, working worldwide before we actually started working in our own backyard. <laughs> Um, and the connecting thread to everybody here is that you are um, all finalists for the Parsec Awards. Um, so what I thought would be fun, this is you know pretty unique um, and fantastic group of, of creators. Um, and I and I sort of threw out this topic of the future of audio drama. But my question is just to get us kick started on this uh, technology thing. What you know, what piece of technology within the last you know year or so do you think is is most interesting? I, I like that it's becoming easier to do um, some mobile recording uh, using your iPad and iPhones with like Apogee has some mics out that um, are, are really able to interface well with GarageBand for, uh, for the iPad and iPhone and that's kind of helped us um, do a little bit more mobile recording, a little bit more um, uh, location uh, shooting. Which uh, of course, Fred, you're you're the master in, and uh, and actually have really served a little bit as an inspiration to us in terms of trying to do some more on location recording. Um, you know, on the broader platform front, uh, I don't think this is really something that's happened over the past year, but you know, we, you know, I'm sure we're going to get into the idea of monetization of audio drama, or how do we support ourselves, how do we keep going with this, and I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of changes with. Um, uh, with the way that Audible has made it a little bit more accessible through their, uh, their I think their ACX program, mm -hmm. where you can um, uh, put your audio drama up for, for sale potentially, and that's something that we're looking into. Joel, technology. Yeah, I don't. I, uh, in the last year, I can't think of anything. In the last year, I've been focusing more on video. Um, I just think it's. I don't know. I, I always feel like uh, smartphones are the uh, are the important thing that people are going to listen on their on their phones and the. You know the continued penetration of smart smartphones. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of a piece of technology that um, is is affecting my work. 
Yeah, but the, the sense of uh, how you, you're choosing to distribute your work um, is obviously a reflection of technology and the you know the fact that you have this uh, the two the app based uh, distribution. Yeah, is I went a, for the I went for the app, uh, the you know the uh, freemium app model. Um, haven't had too much success with it so far, so I don't know. Um, uh, that was my stab at monetization. Mm -hmm. All right, well let's hop on to, to KC. What do you what do you uh, seeing you know technology wise what what is exciting you uh, to be honest not a lot has changed over the last year I mean uh, podcasts I think are continuing to grow in numbers and I think that's uh, they're getting more and more familiar there are some new channels that they're coming out with on some of the set top boxes like you take a look at uh, Roku and some of the Apple TV stuff they're actually doing a lot of uh, revitalization of that stuff and iTunes did put out a new podcast app this last year, so I think those things are there. But I think in general, the uh, the RSS podcast feed is still going to be like the number one way for people can grab the sources, mm -hmm. and that's just continuing to grow, and people are more and more aware of it. I think it's just. Are you back with us, uh, Monique and Matthew? I uh, yeah. Um, so as far as we go, uh, one of the biggest pieces of technology that we've used in the last year, especially with the dialed in show that we did, is uh, using Skype in order to unite actors. You know, we we were able to unite a worldwide cast and have them acting and interacting with one another using Skype as kind of, uh, of a, a, a front end and everybody recorded their parts on their end. We, we made sure everybody had high-end microphones and high-end equipment, um, which is the other thing. Microphones are getting better and they're getting cheaper and you can get really good high-quality microphones for, for less than $100 now. So that, that helps the technology quite a bit. That to you, Claire. <laughs> And you guys have been doing pretty much crowdsourcing as your as, as your primary model. You're yeah, we're, we're solely crowdfunded. So the issue is you, you can make it easily. You can do it on location. A lot of what we've made has been done in my living room. Um, you can get it to people. Internet, smartphones, marvelous. But it's finding a way of creating a habit that people will want to actually pay for it. And so, yeah, as we look at the, in the monetization, um, pod, podcasting is awesome in driving listeners. It's not awesome in monetizing. You're choosing to to produce podcasts. You know what what is the role of podcasting in, in, both today and in audio's future? I, I I think that I think that you have to always be giving some of your content away for free, if not most of it. Um, I I think that. When people engage in audio drama, the, the audiences that tune into all of our shows tend to be very passionate about the medium and, and passionate about the work that we do. And I think that there's a, a very slow growing acceptance and um, um, readiness to, to, to support podcast, audio drama podcasts financially if you make it easier for people to do so. Um, and, and that's the real key, and it's hard. And you know, we, we looked at the app model as well, and I think that's a that's a really great idea. Um, our our fear with the app model, and I'd be very curious to to hear your comments, Joel, was that you you get that, that's such a broad field for apps that you're going to get lost in it. Like if there was an audio drama app folder, then then you could be prominent, but you're going to get lost in the, in the temple runs and the angry birds, and and, mm -hmm. and that, that was our fear with it, but but we may totally have missed the boat on that. Casey, I see you, you hop back. Uh, we're talking about podcasting. Um, I was just remarked that you, you know, your line there about how podcasting has continued to grow in numbers. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts just on podcasting in, as it currently is and for Audio Drama's future? Um, so yeah, uh, I still think that the podcast is going to be the delivery medium for all this stuff. It just goes to show that like everyone still goes to iTunes, they're still going to their aggregates. Uh, however, they're going to get the content, they're still going to get it. Um, but I think podcast is, seems to be like the best and easiest way. And also, it's that free form factor. Everyone's already familiar with it, and um, people. The more that podcasts are coming out there, the more bigger ones. I mean, all the big guys, even though they're making their stuff. People are still looking for other things for entertainment and podcasts, so I think that's a great delivery medium. Um, it's still going to be the strongest form, I think, because if you, even if you have an MP3 on your site, there's so many compatibility issues. Podcasts just seem to make it much, much easier for that to happen. 
Yeah. And, and what do you think? We, we you know, several people brought up monetization already, so let's start jumping right into that question. Um, Casey, on that same token, podcasting, um, you know, you're, we're live is, is, is large enough that it, it is, you know, you're now part of the Nerdist Network. You're able to host ads, but are, are ads the the right way to monetize or what what uh what is a uh, you know how do you, how do you monetize and, and make more pod uh, make more shows when podcasting you know is your you know as for free is your distribution you know primary means of distribution um there's not one direct uh answer for that the basic form i could say is multiple streams of income um will help us support a podcast that is uh google adsense should be the number one thing you have on your site plugged in Get that stuff authorized because honestly, just having the uh, the form and everything on there, and the amount of people that visit the website, the website itself gets like can pay for itself, and then that costs much less for you to have to deal with in the end. Um, having merchandise is a good way to supplement uh, uh, income. Uh, I, a lot of people use uh, some of the free shirt sites and things like that, like Zazzle. The unfortunate part is when you deal with stuff like that, you're dealing with um, you're not going to make very much profit off of it. They're going to make they're money, making money off of you. So that's where it's like, for if you can make your own products and sell them on your own site, you'll make a lot more uh, percentage wise there. And lastly, uh, selling ads on the show. I mean, yes, it's it, we even I like when we first started out, we were selling really cheap ads. It just anything to help uh, the podcast keep going, and that's kind of supplemental costs and things like that. So those are just three methods to kind of bring in more money. Sure. Um, who else wants to talk on this? We, so we, we also have people like Christoph, uh, who is, uh, you know, is, is actually you know, selling direct downloads, um, but you now also have uh, advertiser Christoph, correct? We, we did. We got our very first, uh, our very first sponsor, uh, and... Uh, it's uh, it's it's one two three inkjets dot com. But we, you know, I, I agree with everything Casey is saying. It's it, at this point, it's still a game of inches, and and I think having multiple streams is, is the answer. Um, you know, it's and it's something that does take a little bit of, of time to build up because just as you know, as as Casey was talking about, it's not that your one episode is is so popular. It's that when somebody discovers we're live or Leviathan Chronicles or um, or, or any of the other Big audio dramas. They're, what they're really discovering is is a is a backlog of you know mm. of you know fifty hundred you know episodes that they go into, and and when you're talking to an advertiser, you're not just selling your current audience, but but the fact that you can put that ad you know on 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 you know, on your back catalog, um, Lipson lets you do that. So um, you know we we've been you know our main income stream is is through the selling of premium content. So we we give away our main story and then we we sell the side story. So people like like Leviathan enough, they may want to buy independent um, uh, standalone Leviathan stories, and that that's been our best source of um, of revenue so far. Yeah. So, um, cool. How uh, Matthew Monique, do you have anything to chime in on the monetization pr question problem <laughs> opportunity? Sure. Um, well, as far as uh, as far as the podcast go, we haven't really been able to monetize too much on that. But what we've been able to do is, um, a a as an audio designer, I've been able to to sell my services to to film. To uh, we're actually looking at doing live shows. We've done some work for you, uh, Fred, uh, with the cleanse, and uh, we're we're able to use that. And we take that cash and able to pay for our shows that way. Um, from what I've seen, there there there's this big growth tendency towards, um, and I know the uh, the folks at Our Fair City do this. They they, they they're kind of selling an, an experience, and they're moving towards doing like live shows wh where they can sell merchandise, sell their CDs there. Um, and that that spectacle, that experience of watching people do the audio drama in front of you, uh, is what people are seem to be really drawn to right now. I think I would also add that, like Christoph said, uh, having sponsors really helps. Uh, we don't have any cash sponsors, but we do have sponsors that uh, give us discounts on equipment and technology, and that just takes some of the load off of our costs for produ producing our shows as well. Yeah, we're, we were able to work uh, arrangements with Isotope and uh, Zoom and Samson, and they, they give us really great uh, equipment for uh, much less expensive than you would pay for them commercially. Yeah. 
All right, so Claire, if you're, uh, can you talk about since you've had some you know, success with crowdfunding? You said that is your primary, maybe your only source of revenue. You want to talk about that? We started um, our first couple of episodes when we launched doing Minister of Chance. We were actually charging one pound twenty nine an episode, and we had this fantastic idea that we would charge this very low amount, and we would get people listening to audio drama. And it just didn't work. Is is we had people listening, and they loved it when they did listen, but there was a reluctance to pay. That people have become used to getting all this material for free. There's so much they can get for free. And the minute we decided to go free, we got more money in donations in the first month than we'd, we'd made in the whole time of selling the first two episodes. And I think Casey's nodding, but it was actually Casey talking to Dan that got us that way. Mm. Suddenly people were saying, we absolutely love this. <laughs> here's 20, here's 10, here's, you know, and, and, and even sillier amounts than that. Whereas grabbing those £1.29s one by one was a torturous process. Mm. Uh, I just don't think we have a habit of thinking that we have to pay for stuff that we download from the internet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how and how, how do you have any uh, practical hands-on things about the way you've done the crowdfunding? You know, have you done them as campaigns or do donations stroll in, or do you have any any tips for people who are, who are trying to do this? Well, we've lo we've lurched from episode to episode. I, I heard. Um, oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. I've forgotten your name. The guy with the pink curtain in the background. Oh, Joel. Very yeah, nice Joel. ring. Yeah. You were just talking about whether you charge halfway through or to the end. But I mean, once once we'd gone free, we did it episode by episode. And if they wanted to know what happened next, <laughs> we had a whole new campaign. Now that's worked, and we've raised the money. Dan and I have never got paid. The actors have got paid. The crew mm -hmm. have got paid, albeit rubbish. But we've we've never made it so that Dan and I can monetize it. And we've um, we've had months in between each episode because it's taken us that long to mount each campaign around everything else we're doing. Yeah, I think Claire touches on a good point there, though, that uh, you really do have to pay your talent too. By paying your talent, you get you get access to better and better talent. Um, and I, I think a lot of the, the audio drama podcasts out there may be even lacking in that um, because they go for this free model where you where you know you just grab everybody you can and it's not necessarily the best production quality. I, I want, the one other thought that I wanted to add is that I, I feel like yeah. if there was a way that you have the if there was a way that you could bring, in-app purchases, the way that we have in, in so many of the games and so many other apps that we have. And I've heard some rumblings that in iOS 7, when, when Apple comes out with it, that we might have that ability where where you can essentially, like, it, during your podcast, you can, um, you know, something can come up on your screen where you can go, oh, to listen more or to donate to hmm. this podcast. You know, if you can do it with one click while you're listening to it. I think one of the issues that we all face is people consume our content when they're driving or when they're at work or maybe when they're away from from a computer or from, they're away from a place they can actually get to their digital wallet or wallet to be able to pay us. But I mean I think think that the will is there and you can see it um, by the way that people donate um, and, and, and they do so quite generously. Um, I, I hope the technology is going to grow to the point where people can listen to what we're producing and have the ability to to pay while they're listening. I think that's that's going to be the turning point for uh, for what we're doing. There's a uh, like uh, Christoph was saying, if there is a technical hurdle, if they got over it, that would benefit all of us. Um, and that's if we had the ability to put out an episode early and allow certain people, if they want to pay ninety nine cents to get it early. They can do that, and then everyone else gets a scheduled release because it's all about the now, 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 I want it now kind of theme where it's right. like, it'll come out, but if we offer it early for 99 cents, I guarantee that'd be a great model for making uh, profit off this. Right, and, and, and something that did it within the podcast uh, realm versus forcing them to your own website, which is where you often lose people is just the, the technological you know, inconvenience. So many people want to keep their stuff organized you know like if if we if someone did that though they like if say for instance episode 25 was paid and 24 is not but it's on the podcast feed and 25 is only on the website because that's go paid mm -hmm. that gets problematic and that's where yeah. they don't have the technology supporting it yeah uh, what's interesting about kind of the whole threads with monetization you know there's a few that are kind of just funny technology things but overall it seems to me that the thread about 
is is about audience building. Um, and I guess I'd be curious uh, to get just to have a go around about that uh, topic of audience building. Um, uh, starting with yourself, you like Casey? Um, you know, with with We Are Live going to its fourth season. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, um, and this is part of the way that I, I thought um, has been always great is uh, a consistent release schedule that people can plan out so they know that the, when the epi next episode's coming out. So the minute you put out an episode, you have to release on the same day when the next one's coming out. I think for listeners, they have to know if they're going to get involved, they have to know the schedule of when they can get the next piece. Um, I think that's important. And I think the other part is um, being able to let the people who enjoy your show interact without your um, moderation, like uh, having a forum or a wiki where people can interact. Because we do a lot for We're Alive, and we're uh, really, you know, spend a lot of time. But the cool thing about having a forum is people can get more interactive and more involved with your show without you having to do anything because it's content cre it's uh consumer created stuff like it's people interacting on their own so we just like let the forum exist let people go there and then the interaction between them is all pretty much on their own uh, how about Matthew Monique on the question of um, you know building building an audience and uh, and getting people to hear shows one of the keys the, the, the major key to building an audience is what everybody here is doing and that's just generating content as much content as you can possibly put out there uh, and and the more quality content that you put on the more people start catching on and letting their friends know and letting their friends know and you've really you've really got to hit that viral point where people are just telling people and telling people and pulling that in and the only way you can do that is just by producing a backlog of content Right, and not and not like you know, I've seen so many podcasts that start off very promising and then kind of fizzle part way through, you know, and and it, it's just heartbreaking when you hear a series that had great potential and then, you know, never, you know, they got put out like three episodes and then vanish off the face of the earth. I think there's uh, that. No, if there's a certain point where you, a show needs to hit a certain uh, kind of critical mass before people like trust it, but I, I've definitely gotten that that feedback, um, and you know, and I let. let that's the rest of the panel here. I guess I'd also, uh, just to make it more challenging, uh, not only tips on building audience, but maybe also if you can think of uh, challenges that face us reaching audience. Like for you, Joel, you had mentioned that you know many people still haven't heard of a podcast. So hmm. um, do, you, do you... Do I have any tips for anybody? No. Uh, I, I, I had a... Uh... I had a pretty specific plan in mind that I thought was uh, gold-plated and bulletproof. Uh, I, I, I assembled this cast, um, uh, many of which were character actors in, in you know, well-known sci-fi shows like Star Trek and, you know, Babylon 5 and, and existing properties with a pretty huge following. And I thought, well, they have, they have these legions of fans and they have um, blogs and I'll tap into the bloggers for those things saying, hey, check this out. If you like that, so-and-so is also on my show. Um, and I admit I probably didn't work around the clock on it as much as I should have, but I was I was pretty surprised at the uh, the lack of response from it. Um, I think just because someone likes watching a particular TV show doesn't mean they're going to transfer over to an audio drama. I think it's mm -hmm. a, I think it's a, it's a big leap for a lot of people. We get a lot of resistance to audio drama in the UK. I don't know what you guys experience. Really? I, thought, you are. I thought you still understood audio drama in the UK. <laughs> well, yeah, we, you're, you know, you're, we, you're supposed to be have it. Yeah. I, our only it hope. Well, exactly, but <laughs> we can say to somebody, "Come listen to this audio," and the minute they hear audio drama, you can sense their their attention wandering. It, it's still got <laughs> a reputation of being a very kind of staid, conventional. I'm going to say BBC audio drama, um, <laughs> but where yeah. it's all, but where it's exposition, where where there's a narrator or or someone mm -hmm. pops through the door and says, "Why are you carrying that tennis racket? Are you about to play tennis?" and 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 people think, "Oh, I mean, ooh, that's oh. rubbish." Uh, the minute they listen to what we're all doing, they go, "Oh, that's not what I was expecting it to be. That's great." But it, to get over that initial resistance is a real challenge. She's really right. That it, it, that's the challenge before us all. Getting them to switch over. Getting them to. It's like it's like they haven't read a book in years, and getting them to pick up a book and read print yeah. again. Yeah. It, well, it, I think it's one of the things players. Part of the brain, players. And it's hard for people. 
I think one of the things that Claire is touching on is that we have to stop thinking of audio drama as radio drama. Radio drama yeah. is anachronistic. And um, one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to move forward as using this as a new storytelling storytelling medium. And there are already really successful formats for that, such as film, theater, and the things people are doing with podcasts. But we really have to stop relying on everyone's memory of something that no one understands and really just take this and run forward with it as a storytelling medium and tell the best stories we can using the models that other people are still successfully gra grabbing people's attention with. Um, I think, and the other thing that I seem to I seem to see happening a lot is we're allowing people to tell us, you know, how many sto you know, how many different types of stories and plots there are, and that's that's not true either. We really so you know original work that is storytelling and is really relying on models models that are still successful. Yeah, I've read book after book and everybody uh, on writing and everybody says, well, there's only seven plot lines, there's 13 plot lines, there's 36 dramatic situations. Everybody's got a different number and they're all full of crap because I've heard <laughs> so many different ways of telling a story from a lot of the people even right here that don't fit into these models that they've created for everyone and they're telling all these writers out there that there's only one way to do this thing, or there's only seven ways to do this thing. And I think you need to resist and break that idea in order to uh, uh, create yeah. something bigger than that. The idea that every story has already been told is, you know, it's postmodern garbage. It, it's just, you know, there are unlimited ways to tell stories, it, you know, and I think that it just, re just write something new, reinvent something, and put it out there. Yeah. Hey, Does anyone so have an opinion on why books on tape can be very popular, but our format doesn't it seems to have a hard time finding traction. Well, I think that there's not that much. Where do you go? Where do you go for books on tape? You, you go to Audible.com. I don't think there are that many audio dramas on Audible.com. I think that that's um, you know I think this is something that Fred was 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 really trying to pioneer and work really hard to find. There's no central place to find audio drama, right? I mean, it's 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 content creates right. more content. Like if there was one place that any, everyone could go to discover, you know, all of our podcasts and, and, and all the other audio dramas that are out there, then more people would come. I mean, we, we all can't, not cannibalize, but we all cross-fertilize our productions, I think, to a certain degree. I mean, I have a lot of Leviathan fans that discovered We're Alive and, and vice versa, and, and, you know, we're always getting emails like, hey, I, I heard your trailer on somebody else's podcast, but that may be only like... 10, 15 percent, maybe it's a little bit more than that, but um, but if there was one place they could see all of our audio dramas next to each other, because because you know if anybody if you just put it's what you're seeing before, just put your headphones on somebody and make them listen to what we're creating. No one's walking away saying, right. eh, that's not that exciting. People like it if you just get them to hear it, and to the extent that that they can easily find more stuff, more content that they're already enjoying. I think that that's where we'll see another. Another spike in growth, and and I'm hoping we're we're planning to to get Leviathan up on Audible, you know, the next uh, you know maybe uh, uh, six to nine months, and I'm hoping that's gonna gonna let a lot of people know what's out there in terms of in terms of what we're producing is so different than War of the Worlds and The Shadow and all this old school audio drama stuff that people sometimes mistakenly affiliate us with. What's up, Claire? I was going to say, Audible had several meetings with us. They were wonderfully supportive, very excited by what we were doing, and kept repeatedly coming back and making different offers. Mm. And it, we could never make the math stack up. And I think, for we, we, you know, we looked at this for a long time. It seems to me about it being a primary or secondary source is that most, generally speaking, an audio book is not the primary purpose. Somebody doesn't think, I go and make an audio book. They write a book and then someone turns it into an audio version. And so primarily their income is coming from, from the novelization. For audio drama, you're starting from scratch. That's your primary purpose. And you know, you do an audio book, you have one reader, you maybe have occasionally two or three. But to do a really good high quality audio drama, you need several. And the minute you start doing that and you want to get quality people and have to pay them, you can't get your money back easily via Audible. They, they take such a huge whack even if they come down. It's such a big whack. We couldn't make the math stack on any of the, the offers that they made. 
Yeah. One of the things that we ran into early on when we were doing 1918, which was our first show, is uh, we were talking to other audio dramatists, and everybody was, everybody had this resistance to to equate themselves with the audio book or equate themselves with the podcast. And I think that was actually kind of a detriment to that. I think you need to parallel up to these things and and use these means. I think a lot of the more successful audio dramatists out there ha have, rather than uh, creating a chasm between those things, have embraced them and tried to monetize on all fr as many fronts as possible. I think... You know, to, to, there's you know, audio drama today is very indicative of of bigger trends in in uh, entertainment. You know, this sort of micro micro casting, you know, or, or niche casting. You know, the uh, big budget Hollywood productions. But I don't think people go to that for storytelling now so much as for a technological perspective. I think you know, I think if you want to be wowed with awesome sound effects and, and visuals, you can see a, a mainstream Hollywood movie, but you're not getting blown away with the depth and, and quality of storytelling. And, and pe but the people still want depth and quality of storytelling, and I think that's what audio drama can do really well. And, and I think anyone who who's, feels that you can't have something that's uh, both has high quality story as well as really, really highly entertainment value has not listened to any of the work that the, the creators in this panel have produced because you've all have stuff that's uh, you know that, that that's interesting and exciting and has strong characters and also has you know really badass sound effects and and music. Oh my! And, yes. I, and, I, and I think that's one of the greatest strengths of audio drama. And I also think uh, you know given that the 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 way that. Uh, Hollywood and and film uh, TV production is going. You know, audio drama has a really s strong edge. Um, and so I guess just kind of on that question, just in terms of you know how does audio drama fit into a world of of entertainment? Um, I I'd like to ask that question to the panel. And starting with you, Joel, as yeah. someone who who is actually working in the entertainment business, what's your perspective? Um, and maybe tell people how, why you decided to make an audio drama podcast. I think it's well, well. The why is easy. It's the only thing I could afford to do myself. You know, I I, I would love to go out and shoot a bunch of TV, but that's expensive. It, I, I think we have a we have a medium that is unusual for people. They're just not used to it. They're it's hard for them to find it. It's hard for them to understand. I I honestly think it's a different part of the brain to close your eyes and use your own imagination. I mean, after I produced my thing, I, I challenged myself by listening to it, and I was like, holy shit, you know what? It's actually a bit of work to close your eyes. Imagine a world. Imagine what this girl looks like and that guy looks like and what room they're in. It's, it's, much, it's much more akin to reading a book than it is to letting the Avengers wash over you, which is it's, it's, it's a completely different experience. I love um, that lines, Joel, where uh, that episode where you had the lead character blind. That was a brilliant way to to actually uh, involve us in that world because you know the ca the lead character is blind and you know being pulled into the underground, uh, and we're right there with them in the basement and we can't see what's going on anyways either. So you know it gives us a sense of identification and perspective with them. I, I guess by default you have to use your imagination harder because if he can't see, I guess you can't see. You know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, my, my, my hope, you, you know, one of my thin hopes is that this, this sense of exhaustion, you know, we, we are inundated by story. We are inundated by video. And there's incredible storytelling on cable TV. I mean, the stories that they're spinning on Breaking Bad and all these other shows, it's incredible. It's, it, you know, I, I think the challenge before us is not just awareness, it's, what stories are we telling that we could only tell through our medium? You know, and I think I'm the I, I think I'm, I'm guilty of sin because I look at w what I wrote and what I did, and a lot of times I, I mean I never wanted just to be another cop show, you know. But I think I I think I fell into that. So I think of people like Joe Frank. I mean that is not a TV show. That is a different animal, you know. I I think of Orson Welles' work. That is just a, it's a different experience mm -hmm. and I think the challenge before us is how do we what stories are we telling what techniques are we using what devices are we using that use the audio portion to its maximum because what you don't want to do is take the TV show you always wanted to do and just do the audio 
we we've just got a couple more minutes, um, but so we can riff off that. Just the the future of entertainment. What is the future of audio drama? Um, in that entertain in in that entertainment, do we do we have to do we take audio drama as an opportunity to make stuff? Uh, you know, do, <clears throat> you know how how do how do we choose to to use audio drama in a you know often TV visual centric world? And I, I guess in light of everything else ha happening elsewhere in entertainment, you know what what do you what do you feel like? audio drama's role is in it? Um, I think that it's another medium to tell stories for people on the go. Um, I see a lot of people who are... Um, they use podcasts as a, as a way to be able to continue on in the world while also still enjoying something. That's why I think books on tape are very popular. It's the people who can't literally stop and look at a, a page in front of themselves they have to have something different, and I think that's one of the, the roles of, of audio dramas and anything that's that's an audio story, is to uh, you know give people those stories who can continue to do their tasks and listen to this at the same time. I, I don't see us. I'd love for us to be able to be a, a show where people can sit down and just immerse themselves and listen 100 percent. And we we obviously do have those listeners, but at the same time, I think majority of people are just trying to listen to us on the go. Yeah. Um, uh, Monique, Matthew? Uh, I think if audio drama has one benefit in, in the face of uh, the adventure, so to say, it is that we do have the capability of being intimate and immersive. Um, it's a, it, like you know, Casey is just saying, it's storytelling on a whole new level, and it's up close, and it's personal. Uh, if we can get them, even in their cars and even on the go, we're right there whispering in their ear. And if we could play off of that somehow, I would. I think that that would bring audiences a whole new experience that they're just not seeing yet. Yeah, certainly. And like Casey said, we, uh, we travel a lot. Monique and I will travel to Maine. We travel to, you know, we drive to Minnesota. We drive everywhere we go. And what we we use that time to you know to to listen to these stories that are more immersive and and we're really looking for that that sense of entertainment that that is you know more intimate and has more of a storytelling element than you're able to get uh, from television even. Yeah. Claire, you asked this about the future of entertainment. If you if you look at the whole history of entertainment, it started off as being a very collective experience. It's changed with modern technology and it's a fairly recent thing that we suddenly got the smartphones and the mp3 players and computers in our homes that's that's really only a few decades where people are able to listen to stuff on their own in a solitary way rather than having to go to a theater or to a cinema house to actually access it um, we pass through television in a small lounge with our family we've gone now to just sitting on your own and I just don't think this is quite caught up with it but it will I think we will actually with a bit of luck go down as being the pioneers of creating a whole new habit um, I mean Dan Dan my my partner in crime calls what we make as a sonic movie and that seems to have, have lit imaginations with people that they're actually thinking yeah actually I can get that thought but it's a new thing and it's just going to take time for everyone to think I now access my entertainment on my own I don't have to only listen to music and then I don't have to only listen to an audio book but I could listen to an audio drama but it will take a while for that habit to, to pick in. Yeah. Uh, Christoph, what do you think? Where, where does audio fit into the world, entertainment world today? Well, I, I think it's a lot what, what everybody else has said so far. The, the one place that we continue to compete better than television and better than the Avengers is we get people, uh, you know, w when they can't physically put a screen in front of them, when they're driving, you know, some, perhaps when they're on the treadmill, um, when they're in the subways, when uh, when they're commuting or, or you know, whenever they can't really sit in front of a screen. And... And I, and I think more importantly than that, not only do we get them there, but I think there's also an intimacy, like 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 we were saying before, um, where not only are we are we in their ear, and 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 that's just um, you know another way of, of really you know tapping right into somebody's imagination. But I think for all of us, a lot of our fans like know about us, like they know who we are, they know a little bit about our lives. There's um, you know, I, I don't know a lot about George Lucas or J.J. Abrams and, and you know, what, what they do and where they get their coffee, but I, mean, I think for a lot of us, our fans, you know, have um, a, a little bit more of an intimate connection with, uh, with us as content creators, mm -hmm. and I think that also is an advantage where mm -hmm. we interact with our fans um, more and, and, and more readily than, than I think some of the established Hollywood players. Thanks, everyone. Quickly, we'll just do a round of, of schlep your goods. 
Um, Christoph, where do we find Leviathan Chronicles? Sure, you can go to iTunes uh, and search Leviathan Chronicles, or you can go to our website, leviathanchronicles.com, to, uh, to download or stream our episodes. And you're now in the second season. You've got tons of previous material, and you're still podcasting the news shows. We do. We put out uh, a new episode uh, for season two every two weeks, um, but our listeners can buy the director's cut, which is uh, all 13 episodes at once, and when they purchase a director's cut, they get one hour of bonus storyline that's not available in the free podcast. So I think it's speaking to what Casey said before. We're, we're continuing to periodically release our free content, but for the listeners that want to get all the story at once, they can purchase the director's cut on our site, leviathanchronicles.com, and, um, uh, and, get, and get kind of mainline everything at once. Cool. Uh, Claire, Minister of Chance, uh, ministerofchance.com. It's ministerofchance.com or iTunes, and we have completed a first season of six parts of audio. That's all there now to be downloaded, and if people like it, they can contribute to my bun fund. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, representing the UK. Joel, uh, I know you, you're going to probably want to get to bed. <laughs> to yeah. the day of shooting. Uh, tell, us, tell us what Hot House Bruiser. Sure. Uh, just go to... Uh, you know the iTunes Store. Type in Hot House Bruiser or Google Play, and the app will come up. And uh, just download the free app onto your phone, and uh, you can start listening. And uh, you know you get halfway through it, and then uh, I come on and I say, hey, if you really enjoy this, you know just upgrade and get the rest of it. It's an in-app purchase. Yeah. Well, and uh, please, everyone, uh, do go and sit, buy a few for Joel and make sure that by build, building an app for your audio drama can be successful. Uh, you're going to hear the, the content once you start hearing it. You're hooked. Uh, th- thank you so much, Joel, um, and, and for making it work from your being... Uh, I really enjoyed this. I'm, I'm really glad. Uh, Fred, thank you for putting this together. I think we should do this every couple months, maybe. Yeah, we'll try. We'll, just, we'll work on the, the technical hooks, but it was quite a bit of fun to have us on uh, representing several different continents here. Yeah, um, exactly. Casey, uh, We're Alive is uh, all over the place. Tell us about how to hear more. Uh, it's z- just zombiepodcast.com. Everything else, you, all the iTunes links and stuff's on there. Uh, another shout-out I want to give out real quick, actually, is to, uh, if you go to Google and type in audio drama directory, mm. uh, like it seems like they're also on Twitter. They retweet all of our stuff. It seems like that seems to be a place where... They're constantly updating it, so and they got a lot of even old stuff on there listed. So it's a really cool place where if anybody wants to make sure that there's an audio drama listed, that directory is updated all the time. Really good people run it, so kudos to them. Yeah, and actually, yeah, and I actually see some solid traffic from the directory, so people are using it too as a resource. So um, there's not an, quite enough of them, but um, we're glad that they have they have it. Uh, Matthew Monique, uh, where where do we find Oral Stage Studios? Sure, you can find us at oralstage.com. That's a u r a l stage s t a g e dot com, um, and we're about to get started on a new show called Prophet's Guide, uh, which is it's basically about a prophet turned hero is allied with a villain turned mentor to defeat a prophet turned villain to save their society from absurd facades. All right, <laughs> delicious. So we can't can't wait. Um, and of course, I um, Fred Radio Drama Revival is the showcase podcast show. Everybody on this call has been on Radio Drama Revival at some point in time, um, and we do our best to showcase new stuff out there and let you explore. And um, uh, Matthew and Monique were, uh, worked on my show, The Cleansed, another uh, apocalyptic serialized audio drama podcast, now in its second season with about um, 10 hours of content. Um, plenty to get out there and go listening. Uh, thank you, our esteemed panel. This is a great time. Thanks, Fred. Thank yes. Great job, Fred. Thank Thanks yeah, for thank letting me on, much. man. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>